Tipping over on this side a little bit. I heard y'all talking about it, so I figured I'd make mention. Glad to see y'all this morning. I'm mighty glad to see the house of the Lord here in Heightsburg full as we gather in worship to the Lord to glorify and honor Him. It's uh, as, as summer's beginning to approach, it seems like we can see that light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe even we're in that light uh, at the end of the tunnel now that I see uh, face masks going away. The powers that be say that face masks can begin to disintegrate and uh, I see businesses starting to open back up. It's really a blessing. That's what we've been praying for all this time. And I uh, mentioned to uh, my wife the other day, I don't forget why I was quoting it, but uh, I said, humble ourselves, pray, seek God's face. If we turn from our wicked ways, then he will uh, heal our prayers. He will heal our, heal our nation, hear our prayers. He will bless the people that call upon his name. And so I believe he's heard our prayers and uh, he is beginning to answer that prayer of deliverance from this great pandemic that we have been in for so long. But uh, glad to see, glad to see y'all here this morning. Got a few things going on I want to make you aware of. One is a baptism this morning of Mr. Tyler. Looking forward to that uh, towards the end of the service this morning. I meant to make men mention of that last Sunday and uh, just slipped my mind completely. We did welcome Stacy to our membership last Sunday morning and uh, very thankful for that, giving praise to the Lord for uh, his preparations now for baptism. But uh, Tyler comes forward for baptism this morning. We accepted him on Wednesday night and uh, he'll be joining membership with Buffalo Tabernacle after the occasion this morning. So we're proud of him, looking forward to the services today. As far as tonight, we start back, this will be our first Sunday night Bible study since last March. So we're starting back to Sunday night service tonight at 6 o'clock. Uh, we'll be continuing through the book of Acts where we left off before the pandemic happened. We have been doing some studies in that on Wednesday night, but we'll be in Acts 15 tonight at 6 o'clock. And then at 7 o'clock, we'll be having choir practice. And so uh, if you'd like to be a part of the choir, you notice we don't have the choir yet, but they're making plans for maybe Father's Day. And so looking forward to uh, having them back and singing praises to the Lord that they do so well. And then uh, just want to put a plug in there for the church barbecue. That's coming up June the 5th, the first Saturday of June. And if you would, bring some desserts to share for that. Also, we have plans for Bible school, and so we're having a Bible school meeting this morning after the service, after the baptism. We'll meet downstairs and uh, make a couple preparations for Bible school that's coming up in July. And if you have any children, if you have any grandchildren that you know would like to join us for Bible school, then there are forms in the back there in the foyer that uh, if you could fill those out, they're a pre-registration form so that the uh, Bible school volunteers can know how many to prepare for, how to divvy up the classes so we make sure we've got enough material for them, uh, arts and crafts, food, all of those things that go into planning for that. So if you'd pick up one, if you don't have one already, and uh, take it to someone that you know would like to be a part of Bible school or invite them to our Bible school, that'll be the 1st of July there, the 7th through the 10th, and really looking forward to that. I got a card here I need to read. It says, Dear Heightsburg Church family, we are so thankful and truly blessed by our brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for your prayers and each act of kindness extended to Horace Lee during his illness and to our family since his home going. We have felt the prayer of the Lord and find peace in his life and care. And that's with love from Hyder, Betty, Randy, and Teresa. And we do continue to pray for them as uh, they mourn the loss of Horace Lee. We also uh, want to remember families. I know we'll have prayer time here shortly, but uh, we want to remember the Hollis Bowen family. Hollis Bowen went to be with the Lord yesterday morning. And uh, keep the Johnny Rice, uh, keep Johnny Rice and his family in your prayers. Uh, he's uh, definitely going downhill, but definitely want to lift up Paula and uh, all of her sisters as they uh, take care of him right now. I want to read a passage of scripture this morning to head into the message later on. And it comes from Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. I 
tried to refrain from preaching on baptism this morning, but it's one of those things when we have a baptism service, our minds are focused on it, we're thinking about it, we reflect back to when we had our baptism, and so I, I felt it necessary that uh, we reflect upon what baptism truly is, not necessarily the water baptism, but the spiritual baptism that we have experienced once we came to faith in Jesus Christ, and that's clearly displayed by Paul in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. He says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Keep that in mind as we go through the services this morning. Well, that's all that I have. Anything else need to be made mention of this morning? The special music for the barbecue. The special music for the barbecue, the, the backups to the backups of the backups. Now, the, uh, we last Sunday made mention that the Beulah Land Quartet wouldn't be able to join us this year for the barbecue. So there's an up-and-coming local group that's uh, trying to hit it big called the Preacher Boys. And uh, they're going to be singing a few songs I get to be a part of. And uh, looking forward to that, uh, we'll plan on singing if weather permits outside. And uh, we've been practicing to try to share a few songs of joy in that. But appreciate that. Anything else? If not, I'm going to turn it over to Brother Robert Shepherd. He's going to lead in uh, Children's Church this morning. And uh, if all the children will come and give him your undivided attention. Come on, have a seat here if you like. Thank you, Dad. Come on, have a seat. Sat him. He's not going to bother. That's good. All right, I got my satchel here. And you're wondering what's in here. Well, when we go to do a job, you've got to have the right tool so you can do the job. Let's see what we have in here. Anybody know what this is? You open a can of peas, can of soup. And that's a good thing to have. Some of them have electric. Let's see. Anybody know what this is? A what? No, not quite a screwdriver. Feel the roughness on that. What would you do with that? You seen your daddy use it? No, but that's close. This is a saw file for your chainsaw. Your chain goes around and you take that file and sharpen it to chain. How about this? Well, that's that's very close. You're, you're right on that. This is a saw wrench. If you take your spark plug out of your chainsaw or trimmer, that's what you use. Has a purpose. And this is a, something unique. This is called a chain wrench. If you're going to change your oil filters on a dozer motor grader, you can take a chain wrench or a bigger one and you can take the filters off. So they all have a purpose. What kind of tools would you as a Christian need? Bob. You're right. Let's see what we have here. There you go. And what else might we use? Hello, Dad. Can player? <laughs> <laughs> All right. How about 
to Sunday school. Do it all the time. Many of you are in Sunday school. It's good to have because week to week we know what our next lesson is going. How can we study if we don't know what the next lesson is? Next week's lesson. So Sunday school book is very valuable. And I've got two other items that are not in the bag. Yes, sir. Well, that's very good. <laughs> but we can't carry him in the bag all the time. <laughs> He's good to have. The two items that you as a Christian at your age can use are one is a wave. Everybody likes to have somebody wave to you. You can be like Tommy Elliott driving his dump truck. He throws up a finger. Hey. Or you can be like James Hart and throw you on oh, where's the wonder like that? <laughs> I kind of settle for something in the middle. No. The other tool doesn't cost you a cent. You can carry it with you all the time as prayer. Each of you can have a prayer, even you. You can say, God, thank you for your parents. Thank you for the sunshine. Thank you for the rain. Pray for Grandma that she will feel better, etc. Dear Lord, thank you that I have good health get out and do things today. So prayer is very essential in the Bible. And I got a uh, verse here to read. The two greatest commandments. And one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together asked, which is the first commandment? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandments greater than these. So basically, Jesus is saying, Love God with all your heart, with all your mind, and the other, love your neighbor as yourself. You might not like everybody you see in life. That's true for us adults. But God says, love everybody. You have to love everybody and treat them kind. Okay, men, I thank you for your attendance. And we'll have a quick prayer. But here's something I want you to think about. When you see Tyler come up here and be baptized at the conclusion of service, he's already accepted Christ a long time ago. What he's doing today is he's saying publicly, I am proud to be a Christian. I am proud to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And what a great testimony for a young man who has just finished college and beginning a job that he is willing to say, I am a Christian. And he can be a great witness to people by being a Christian and letting others see Jesus in him. So think about that when you watch him being baptized. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for these young boys and men being here today. We thank you for their attendance. We thank you for the parents that brought them. We pray that you will bless them and guide them as they learn in Sunday school and hear your word each day. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, this passage. That's the plan.
Thank y'all guys, all, all y'all kids for coming, appreciate it. <clears throat> it is prayer time this morning. If anybody has any requests from the floor, prayers, praises, anything y'all want to mention, now's the time. Barbara Royal family. Barbara Royal. Any other? Kind of quiet. Wayne Carter. Mother. Wayne Carter. Mother. Mother. Okay. Night. okay, Wayne Carter's mother. Her name's Lynn. Lynn Lynn, that's her name. Okay. W H E N. W H E N. Okay, thank y'all. Any others? Bowen family. And the others? Elmo Bone. John, yeah, John Perea. <clears throat> whole lot of on this list. Whole lot of requests this morning. <clears throat> he even breaks all these down by name on Wednesday night. <clears throat> Seven o'clock. So y'all all welcome to come for our prayer service. Any unspoken requests? We always have those. Sometimes it's hard to mention. <clears throat> so any praises this morning? Beautiful day. We got strength to stand, talk, breath. Amen. All that have breath, praise the Lord, the Bible says. That's a praise. <laughs> yeah, that's a praise, John. We're thankful. Any others? I just got a text from Buck Cox. He still has a stomach issue. Buck, okay. Pray for Buck. Buck's, Buck's on the list, too. Uh, Miss <clears throat> Deborah just play soft for a little while and I'll close it. I thank y'all. <laughs> just pray that thank you for this day and the strength to stand before you <clears throat> and serve. Just pray, Lord, your Holy Spirit leads this prayer time and this service and each and everything we do daily. Just pray that we clear our minds and direct our praise to you and, and just thank you for the opportunity to pray. Just thank you, Lord, for your healing powers and, <clears throat> and not only just for the health of the body but for your spiritual wellness as well. And thank you, Lord, for your grace. It's always sufficient. Your mercy is renewed each day. We thank you for that. Thank you, Lord, for all your many blessings. And just pray your direction in this service. Give Ian the words that you'd have us to hear and direct it to our hearts. And just pray, Lord, we can be the people that uh, you created us to be. And uh, all things, Lord, I just pray for your honor and glory that it would be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Our offertory hymn this morning is 526, The Silent Rock. Let's all stand and sing the first and last verse. Oh! 
service, we uh, bring your, our tithes and offerings to you. So let us open our hearts and our minds and our spirit and our wallets that we might bring back to you a portion of that which you have blessed us with. And we pray, God, that you will use it to the furtherance of your gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. doxology. do rejoice this morning as we prepare to baptize a fellow believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the practice of baptism really isn't talked a lot about in the Old Testament. As far as we know, it never occurred in the Old Testament <laughs> times between Genesis and Malachi. The first time we see baptism even talked of is John the Baptist. One of the reasons why Heightsburg Baptist Church is a Baptist church is because of the workings of John the Baptist, his prophetic proclamations that he made, his uh, preaching of the repentance into baptism that he called for. And so it was John the Baptist that began this practice that we will do this morning, but it was Jesus that showed us the need for it. It was Jesus that went to the water to be baptized, to be immersed into the water by his fellow brother, John the Baptist, a brother in the faith, I should say, as Jesus went to the Jordan River there to be baptized, he showed us the perfect example. He showed us that he had nothing to repent of. He was the completely sinless man, the only one to ever walk the face of this earth, the only one that ever will. He's had no need to repent of sins as all the other believers that came to be baptized, but rather he had one mission, and that was to set forth a perfect example for us to follow and for us to obey as we do so this morning and as you have done in your life. When we think about baptism, we always think about the baptismal pool, the water, maybe the creek or the river that you were baptized in, maybe even the lake. But baptism has such a deeper meaning than that. John the Baptist even said, the one that comes after me, he will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I'm, no great, I'm not great enough to even loosen his sandal straps, he said. But we always think about the water. We think about that time when Jesus came to John. He said, this must occur in order for me to begin my ministry. We know that Jesus was placed into the water. He came up. As soon as he came up, the heavens were divided. The Holy Spirit descended in the presence of a dove, came down upon Jesus. And as all of that occurred, the Heavenly Father spoke from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. That's all of really our first thoughts about wa water baptism. But I want to, this morning through the scriptures, broaden our concept of understanding true salvation baptism. How are we truly saved in baptism? It's not done by the water. This morning... Our message is answering God's call. And the reason for that is because Peter is going to define baptism as answering the call of God with good conscience, 
we'll see from Peter that the washing of water has been the plan of God ever since the foundation of the world. And we're going to go back to there in the beginnings of this world when a great baptism, immersion of water, took place. We're going to see that this necessary cleansing had to take place in the same way that we must be necessarily cleansed in our souls. If our souls remain filthy, if our souls remain disobedient unto God, then they will not be accepted by God and thus will be destroyed in the second death. But this has all been made possible through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It would not have been possible. We would not be able to be cleansed in spiritual baptism were it not for Jesus' death and his resurrection. And once we are cleansed in the faith, it doesn't stop here. It doesn't stop today for Tyler. It didn't stop for any of you when you were baptized. That was only the beginning. That was the beginning of that local church body holding you accountable, that you are now following Jesus Christ, that you are in this new life. You have been reborn. And so in that calling, you must follow that which Christ has commanded, which we'll see also from Peter. But I want to pray for us, and then we'll open the scriptures to 1 Peter. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word. We are so grateful, Father, that we are able to gather today uh, for this special occasion. And Lord, we pray now that you will speak to us. Father, I just step aside and ask that your Holy Spirit anoint me with the words to say that uh, this congregation will only see you just come off of the page of your word and enter into the souls that it might be applied to each and every soul, mind, heart that is represented here today. May they know, may they understand, may they be able to proclaim your word that has been so given to us. And Lord, we just commit this time to you and submit ourselves to your throne. It's this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 3 is where we'll be for the entirety of our time this morning. 1 Peter chapter 3, we'll pick up in verse 18. I've done a lot of preaching from 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, really the whole part now, but I can't say I've ever preached a message, though, on this last five verses of the chapter. But here in 1 Peter, the Apostle Peter, we're learning a lot about on our Wednesday night Bible studies. The first part of the book of Acts tells us about Peter's ministry, his mission, especially around Jerusalem, his mission to proclaim to the first Gentiles in Cornelius' household. Uh, all of these things Peter was used for after the ascension of Jesus. Here the Apostle Peter is writing to Jewish Christians. Not only are they Jewish Christians freely worshiping God, they are persecuted persecuted Jewish Christians that have been dispersed under the persecution of Nero. In that persecution, they have had to literally flee for their lives. And in the first part, it lists many different places that they had to go, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and other places that they could freely worship. And so Peter writes this in order to encourage them, to give them some sense of comfort, hope, peace, and when we think about the time frame here, these are truly new believers. These are believers that haven't known Jesus Christ for that long. They haven't had faith in Jesus uh, for their entire lives. And so they need that encouragement in this new faith because you know as well as I do, when you first came to faith, when you first came to trust in Jesus Christ, it seems as though that's when Satan tries to pull you back out of that the hardest and the strongest. It seems as though that's when the questions begin to happen. That's when the lack of faith or the lack of diligence to gather in worship seems to occur. And so they needed this encouragement from the apostle who is also an elder in the early church at this time. So we begin in verse 18. Peter says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. So to comfort these persecuted believers, he reminds, them, he reminds them of the sufferings that Jesus went through. He says that this isn't an easy road. This isn't something that was going to come easy for you to grow in the faith, mature in the faith. Remember who you are following. Remember who you are trying to be an example of. It is Jesus who has just suffered for his doing of the will of God. For him being who he was, he had to suffer. And now in you, trying to become more like him, 
you're going to have to suffer the same. You are in this condition because of your faith, but it is a good thing, is what Peter in a nutshell says. He says that Christ suffered once for sins, and that suffering is defined as the just for the unjust. Christ was just. He was innocent. He had done nothing wrong, but he died for all those that had. He died for the guilty sinners that condemned him to the cross, that said, crucify him, crucify him. That's the ones that Jesus went and died for, the unjust. Why did he do it? It says there that he, being Jesus Christ, might bring us to God so that we could be brought to God. That was his sole purpose for being born in Bethlehem, for living the life that he did, for going into his three and a half years of ministry, for calling the disciples, for performing the miracles amongst the crowds, for doing all that he did, teaching as he did. He did so for one sole purpose, to bring us, the unjust, the guilty sinners, to bring us to God. It could only be done by the Son of God, the perfect, sinless Son of God that brought forth the example for us to follow. And so when we think about Jesus, who he is, his name was Emmanuel, God with us. And so being Christ, Christ is God with us, and now God can truly be with us and within us because the Messiah, Emmanuel, has come and completed all in which God intended for him to in that satisfactory sacrifice the last part of verse 18 says being put to death it's still talking about christ here being put to death in the flesh but made alive by the spirit that's the only way that's the only way that jesus could have accomplished peace for us with god bringing us to god was for him to die in the flesh but be alive in the spirit his flesh died we could read all of the scriptures that say that he received the crown of thorns as it lacerated, excuse me, lacerated all around his head. We could read about the whipping that he had to endure and all of the flesh that was ripped during that time. We could look at the cross when he was brought upon the cross and as he began to breathe his last breaths, the soldier stuck the spear in his side and blood and water gushed out of his abdominal cavity. We could think about all those things, but none of those things killed Christ Jesus the Lord. None of those things brought Jesus to death. When we think about every gospel account, they say he gave up his spirit. He gave up his spirit. He didn't allow any person that he had created, nothing is created by him, everything is created through him, in that everything is being created by Jesus, Jesus created the ones that made him suffer. Jesus created the ones that nailed his hands to the cross. He is God, God with us. And as we think about that, we must remember that that's not where he remained. He's not still in the tomb this day. He's not still on the cross this day. His spirit remained alive, as it says there, he was put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. That is His Spirit. The Spirit of God that remained in Him, remained alive, even though His body hang lifeless there on the cross and later laid in the tomb. What did His Spirit do? What did Jesus do those three days that His body laid in the tomb, but His Spirit was alive? We might say, well, that might be a question I have for Jesus when I get to heaven. But Scripture already tells us what he did, and it's here in verse 19. It says, By whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. It says there that his spirit that remained alive while his fleshly body remained in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, Jesus' spirit continued in ministry. His spirit, it says, went to the prisons and preached. Now this isn't the prisons that were in Jerusalem. This isn't the prisons that were under the king during this time or that Pilate had anything to do with, the prisons that uh, Barabbas was released out of. It's not those physical prisons that Jesus went and, pre pre went and preached to. It was a spiritual prison. It was Hades. It was hell where the condemned souls reside for all of eternity. It was there that the alive spirit of Jesus, the Son of God, went for three days and preached to the condemned souls 
in Hades. I've heard Hades a lot this week. Everybody keeps saying it's hot as Hades out here. It has started to get that way. But Jesus went and he preached to these condemned souls in hell. And you might say, well, what did he preach? Was he trying to preach them out of hell? Was he trying to convert them in some way? You can read in Colossians chapter 2. I won't go there this morning. But it says that he preached triumph over these souls. He preached that he was victorious over the death that they could not be victorious over. I've heard songs sung that said that Jesus went and he took the keys from Satan during those three days. He took the keys of the world away from Satan because now he was the king of the world because he had conquered the death that contained the world. That's what Jesus did. He preached victory over the condemned souls of hell. Verse 20, it tells us about these souls who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. These spirits, they were not unjustly condemned by God just because God saw fit for them to be placed in the prisons for souls. But rather, it says, Peter makes very clear, they were formerly disobedient. It was by their actions, their decisions, their evil desires that they did not save themselves from by turning to God. It was by that evil that they lived in and that disobedient to God that they were placed in the prison for the spirits. But in that disobedience showed God's divine patience. And obviously he's alluding to Noah's time here as he talks about the eight souls that were saved. And we'll look at that there in a moment. But one thing I want to make clear here. Anytime we can understand something about God, it's a good time to pause and see what it is we can understand about our Creator, our Savior, our Sustainer, our Lord. And it says here, you notice there that that word divine is capitalized, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah. That said, God's patience. God is a patient God. What I want to be clear on is that God is not patient for the disobedient. God is not patient for those that turn away from him. God in his nature would have them completely struck down in the minute that they turn from him, disobey him, do not follow his commands. We see examples of that throughout the scripture. Anytime the Ark of the Covenant was not uh, considered holy, was not treated as sacred, anytime it was mishandled, God struck them down instantly. The time in Acts when the two believers, the husband and wife, sold everything they had but only brought a portion of it back to the members, the apostles of the church. God struck them down instantly because they lied. God has no patience for the disobedient. The reason why God has the divine patience that he does is for those that will come to obedience in him. For those that will trust in him, God is patient. I can tell you now, God is more than ready to send his son Jesus back to this earth. But he doesn't send his son Jesus back in his judgment, in his wrath, in the condemning power that he has given to his son. He doesn't send Jesus back yet because there are still some amongst us that have yet to make that righteous decision. God knows they're going to make that righteous decision. And so in his divine patience, divine long suffering, he waited in the days of Noah and he waits on those today. That's why God is patient. So God is patient not for the disobedient. God is patient for the obedient. And the obedient in this time was that of Noah. God had to be patient about 120 years upon 500-year-old Noah as he built the ark. God would have saw fit as evil as the world had gotten to go ahead and send the flood then. But he waited for the one righteous, the one righteous family, I should say, to build the ark have it prepared so that their souls could be saved. Let's look at that for a moment. These eight souls that were saved in Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 verses 5 through 8 and then I'll just briefly mention verse 17. This is after the creation of Adam and Eve but not a lot of time takes place between the creation, the fall, the sin of Adam and Eve, the curse of Adam and Eve 
And then this flood that God sent. We could read through chapter 5, and I'm sure people have figured out the certain amount of years that took place between Adam and Eve's sin and the flood, but I know that Noah is 500 years old at the time God says the flood is going to come. He builds the ark for about 100 years. He's about 600 years old when he enters with his family into the ark. And so with all of those about numbers, I know that at least 500 years have taken place since the death of Abel, since that first sin. But picking up in Genesis chapter 6, you know the story well about Noah and the flood. We pick up in verse 5 before God even tells Noah what's about to take place. Genesis 6, 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart, of man's heart, was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry. That really makes you stop and pause for a minute. The Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth. I've studied theology, I've studied the things of God, I've tried to understand God to the best of my ability and then bring it forth here from this pulpit to every Sunday morning. And I can't understand everything about God and his nature, but I do know this, he looked upon the earth from the heavens. He looked upon the earth and he was sorry for the people that had come about, the same people that he had made in his image, the image of God, he made them. And he was sorry for the shape that they had gotten in. And I stopped for a moment because I wonder, when God looks down upon America, when God looks down upon the earth, how much worse are we? How much more evil are we, are the intentions of our heart, now that sin runs so rampant around us? When God looks down, is he sorry for the people that he has created? For the shape the world has done God in. Yeah, I just something to ponder there. But he says, The Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Not only is he sorry, but the Lord grieved for the shape the world had gotten in. Verse 7, So the Lord said, I will destroy man, whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air. Again, he says, For I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The people of the world that were created in the image of God had completely fallen away. But notice there what the Lord said. He said, I'm not doing this out of any injustice of mine. I'm not doing this just out of my divine sovereignty. I'm not doing this just because it was in my plan for this to occur. I'm doing this because of the decisions of man to disobey me. He says there in verse 7, I will destroy man whom I have created. I'm sorry that I made them, but all of that is because of verse 5 there, that there was great wickedness of man in the earth, that every intent of the heart was only evil. That's why God saw fit to bring the flood upon the earth. It was this cleansing flood that would take place, this cleansing of water that would never happen again. Now as we think about the world's current condition, the shape that the people are in and this earth and the inhabitants within it have become in, we're not waiting on a cleansing of water again. But the scriptures tell us all throughout that there is a purifying fire that will come from the judgment of God, that everything will be consumed. All of the wickedness that Satan has dwelt in will be consumed by that purifying fire. The world will be like gold. When gold has all of its imperfections and blemishes and scratches, you can heat it up with an intense fire, bring it back, and it's completely pure again without those blemishes, without those scratches. Verse 6 where he said the Lord was sorry and he grieved. This brings us to a personal knowledge of God. God is so with us. God is so like us that he grieves as we grieve as it showed us there that he was sorry and he grieved because of the sins of man. And then verse 7, it says, Because of the evil, because of the sin that was ever present, the Lord could only do one thing, and that was destroy the disobedient. But it says man and beast. Man and beast was destroyed. The creation itself and the uh, members of creation 
all of the beasts, all the animals of the earth that Adam had the opportunity to name, they would be destroyed because of man's sin. They too had become wicked. All of this had been bred from Adam and, Eve, Adam and Eve's first evil decision, disobedience there in the Garden of Eden. But it's in verse 8 that we see this divine long-suffering that Peter talks about. It's this divine patience of God that he doesn't just send the rushing waters down, but rather he waits upon the righteous family of Noah. Verse 8, Genesis 6, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Anyone that tells us, anyone that finds grace will not be destroyed. But Noah didn't find grace just by the Lord's divine choosing of Noah. Noah didn't find grace just because he wasn't as wicked as everybody else. He found grace because of the life he lived. And we see that in Genesis 6, 9. It says, this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man. Just is another word for righteous. He was a righteous man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. That's how Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord because he followed God, he walked with God. And so that brings us to our first point. We answer God's call by walking with God. That's, this here is where we gain our example of how to live righteously in its simplest form. Think about Noah's current condition. He is surrounded by sin. Every heart around Noah besides his family, every heart has evil thoughts continually. That's all that consumes them. And when we think about the current condition we live in, as a church, let's say Noah reflects all the righteous saints that are members of a church. We are having to live amongst sin. We are having to live, live amongst the darkness of this world that Satan has brought forth. Sin grows and thrives like we see kutzu on a tree. It grows and it consumes and it thrives and it brings anything near it to consumption of its evil ways. Only if we walk with God, when God calls us, only if we choose to walk with Him will we be saved and will not face destruction. We will be preserved. Verse 17 of Genesis 6 is where Noah gave the promise, uh, Noah received the promise from God about what would take place. Genesis 6, 17, And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under, under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. That's about as clear as it gets there. People say the flood was only in a certain place. It was only uh, in the certain mountains in that region that it covered. It was a worldwide global flood. Every mountain of every place was covered. And we could read about how deep it was. But everything that had breath died that was disobedient unto God. And so with that reminder of the flood, we come back here to 1 Peter 3. In 1 Peter 3, we pick up in verse 20. I just read for you. It says that eight souls were saved through water. And then he gives an explanation here in verse 21. I'd say verse 21 is our focus verse this morning. Peter says, there is also an antitype. Now, what is antitype? Antitype is a parable. It is the same as taking anything spiritual, anything that is of God, anything that is of heaven that we cannot understand, and bringing it into an earthly explanation in that we can understand. And so that's what he means when he says an antitype. There is a metaphor, we could say. There is a parable. There is a, a comparison which now saves us. And then it says baptism. But then Peter, almost out of necessity, he makes clear what he means by baptism. He says, not the removal of the filth of the flesh. I'm not talking about that kind of water baptism, Peter says. Rather, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What he's done there is he's given us a definition of what true saving baptism is. It's the answer of a good conscience toward God's call. When God calls you to accept His Son Jesus as Savior, 
and you reject that call, or as we do today, ignore that call, eventually that soul that ignores or rejects God's call to salvation will be destroyed because they will be deemed disobedient, just as those in Noah's day. And so we answer God's call by walking with God being our first point. Our second point is that God has called many to be saved. Jesus taught about that. Jesus said many are called, but few are chosen. Many, and that is, I would even say all, have the opportunity to see that there is a God, to see the need to accept a Savior. Everybody has that opportunity, but whether or not they do is up to them. Whether or not they accept Christ as Savior is up to whether or not they answer that call to salvation. And as he says here, this good conscience, what he means is when in good conscience we answer God's call by accepting Christ into our heart, receive the Holy Spirit, then we are spiritually baptized by God. That is when we accept true salvation. We can only be called by God, we can only answer God, and we can only give a true salvation producing answer to God through the last part of verse 21 there, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Water baptism, immersion, that's in which we're going to do here shortly, that doesn't save you. That doesn't provide salvation. Yes, the water removes the filth of the flesh, but this water can't remove the filth of the soul. And that's what God is in the business of saving. God is in the business of saving souls. God is in the business of redeeming us because he has sent his son to redeem us, to be God with us and to bring God to us. And so when we realize the symbolism that is ever present here, we realize in Noah's time, it wasn't the ones that were in the water that were saved. It was the ones that were in the ark that were saved. And Dr. John MacArthur, he made a lot of headlines here last year because they wanted to shut his church down because he wasn't following the government mandates. I'm sure you heard about him. I really respect him, man. Learn a lot from him so much every year. But John MacArthur says this about the ark and how it serves as a symbol for Christ. He says, in the same way, and we just went through a sermon series on this, in the same way we are found in Jesus Christ, when we are likened unto his death, likened unto his resurrection, when we are conformed to the image of the Son of God, that is Christ Jesus our Lord, when we are in Christ, then we are saved. When Noah, they didn't have Christ to be in, but when Noah realized that he needed to follow God, that he had to answer whether or not he believed that there was a flood coming, when Noah figured... Uh, literally walked into the ark that was figurative of us walking into Christ that we would be saved from the judgment of God as we accepted Christ into our life removed the filth of our souls then when destruction comes when the seven years of tribulation come we are brought above that in the same way the ark was brought above the waters we will be brought into the heavens meet Christ in the air and all the seven years of tribulation will take place here on earth we won't have to experience that wrath we won't have to experience that prison for the souls, for the disobedient. We have been saved. God has preserved us because we have chosen to walk with him. Verse 22, 1 Peter 3. Who has gone, Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. The resurrected Jesus now sits at God's right hand. In doing so, he accomplishes verse 18. He brings us to God. He is our intercessor. He receives our prayers. He brings us peace with him. He is the only one in which we can pass through in order to come before God and answer that call to faith. Now, we've looked at all these things. You realize what spiritual baptism is now, answering that call of God in true faith in Jesus Christ, accepting Christ into your heart. You understand those things. But if you remember the first part of this message in the introduction, I said that it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop with just being obedient. It doesn't stop with just coming to that first call of salvation. It doesn't all end there. 
but rather you have now entered into a new life. You have been reborn. It is considered the new birth. And so you are now called by God to live out this new life from this day forward and forevermore. You are called now to be a Christ-like example, both indoors and outside of doors. You are to live as Christ lived, follow what Christ taught. And you might say, well, how could I do such things? Well, Peter continues his thoughts because he knows these believers need this warning, need this encouragement as well. And he does so in verses 1 through 6 of chapter 4. You'll notice this is all the same thought here. Verse 18 to verse 6 is all the same thought of Peter before he goes into his next section here about serving God. But 1 Peter 4, 1 says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. In arming yourselves with the same mind, he says, For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Notice three things there, if you broke that passage down. Since Christ suffered, have the same mind, cease from sin. Because Christ suffered for you, you came to faith in him. In coming to faith in him, you now have the same mind of him. It says that the law, when we come to know Christ, the law of God is written on our hearts and our minds. And so when we have the same mind of Christ, think about Christ's mind. His mind had to go through the will of God. Even though he asked God to remove that cup of wrath from him, he knew that he must follow the will of God to the point of suffering, to the point of death. Because we have answered that call in such way, we are called to stop sinning, to cease from sin. Point number three, those chosen by God, once they answered the call of faith, those chosen by God must stop sinning. They can no longer delve into that old life that they were once in. They can no longer do that which they used to. I can tell you folks, I'm stepping on my own toes right now. When we came to know Christ, when we came to know Him as Savior and said, Lord, You are the Lord over my life. I submit myself to You. I kneel before Your throne in my humility. I need You. When we came to Christ in that way, we said that we are going to stop that old life. We aren't going to sin any longer. We aren't going to delve into those things we once did. Peter talks about that. He says that he, those that live in the flesh, should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men. But he should live for the will of God, that is having the same mind, living as Christ lived for the Father's will. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. Notice how general Peter is there. He says, whoever he's writing to, whether they got saved the day before this letter got there, whether they got saved and are part of the church leadership in these different areas that he writes to, he says, you have spent enough time in sin in your past life, whether it's been for 20 years, whether you got saved at seven years old, you've sinned long enough. It's time now to live for the will of God, live righteously unto him. He says, when we walked in lewdness, these are the sins he lists. When we walked in lewdness, that is just continual, habitual sin. You want to be in it. Lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, so they are speaking evil of you. He says, any of those past sins that you once were in, you're still going to have friends that continue in that sin. They're going to think it's strange when they see a change in you, but praise God, they see a change in you. They're going to even speak evil against you. They're going to try to say that you should come back that you should be as they are burdened in this sin. But don't do so. You've been chosen out of that sin to stop from that sin. Verse 5. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. They won't give an account to you. They won't give an account to their pastor. They won't give an account to any other Christian. They will give an account to God who created them in the same way those that were in the floodwaters of Noah gave an account to God for their disobedience. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, 
that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. He says those that have passed on, those that have received the gospel, they trusted in Jesus, they answered God's call. Those that have passed on, this is the reason why we preach the gospel to them. And I know when I think about baptism, and I think about my loved ones, I find comfort in knowing that they followed to obedience the need for baptism, that in which to join a local church, in which to be part of them. It gives me comfort in knowing that they were so confident in their faith that they publicly professed. And so us, as trusting in Jesus as Savior, we must do as Noah did, walk with God, obey his commandments, give an answer to God in good conscience, accept his will, and accept the mind of his son, Jesus. How will you answer God's call today? God may have been trying to reach you for quite some time now. We have a different understanding of this in the 21st century than others now that we're on this side of telephones, smartphones, and those types of things. But how will you answer God's call when he calls you to salvation, when he calls you to trust in Jesus? Will you reject him or will you accept him? This is what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. We'll end with God's word. He says, Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we have gathered before you today, Lord, we thank you. We know, Lord, that you have spoken to us as we have opened your word. We have seen your truths. And Father God, I pray that if there is a disobedient soul in here today, if there is one that still has a soul full of filth that cannot be cleansed by any man's means of immersing into water, Father God, I pray that they accept your son Jesus, the only one that can cleanse their souls, the only one that can bring them to peace with God. May they accept him today. Father God, I pray for us as believers, as those that have trusted in Jesus, that are called to the same mind, are called to the same mission of doing the will of God. I pray, Father, that you help us with that last point there. Help us to stop sinning. Help us to refrain from all of that that seems to engulf around us. And Lord God, may we come to forgiveness when we do fall into temptation. Father, may we always come before your throne, not taking your grace for granted, but thanking you for your grace. And Father, may you forgive us when we fail you. Lord, I pray as we go forth this service today, as we enter Tyler into the local fellowship of church membership, as he follows in obedience and by example that which Christ has commanded, we pray, Father, your blessings upon him. And Lord, may we as a church support him in this endeavor from this day forward to disciple him, to make him a mature believer in you, to help him grow and persevere in the faith. Father, we pray that you give us the strength and the ability to do so for him and his family. Lord, we thank you for this occasion. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We're going to stand and sing our invitation this morning. And uh, I'm going to say, Tyler, if you want to go ahead and start getting ready during the invitation, feel free to do so. And if you have a need this morning, if you need to make a decision, then the altar is open. And so we're going to stand and we're going to sing uh, page 330. Are you washed in the blood? We'll just sing the first verse of that. <laughs>
have an insert. And that's one of Tyler's favorite songs. I asked him what he would like for us to sing as uh, I got ready for his baptism and as uh, he prepared. And uh, so I'm going to ask Tim if you'll lead us in that last song while we get ready. <laughs> Tyler, I'm going to ask you to come, and I want to 
tell you about my friend and brother in Christ. Uh, me and Tyler have uh, really enjoyed getting to know each other the last few years. And uh, Tyler, Tyler's a lot like myself. Very reserved, uh, very much uh, not wanting to be a part of the spotlight, and uh, just wanting to do as Christ commands. And uh, so Tyler stopped me, and, and the only way I know Tyler would know how to, he uh, stopped me while I was mowing grass about, uh, <laughs> about two months ago. And I uh, saw his truck pull up in the yard and rode on up there. And, uh, he began to tell me about his uh, testimony. He began to tell me about how he had been saved at a young age, uh, 12, 13 years old, 12. And uh, being saved at 12 years old, he never was baptized afterwards. And so he, going back and forth to college, kind of felt the Holy Spirit tugging on his heart, uh, a little conviction of not being baptized. And uh, so he said, I'd like to be baptized. He hadn't talked to anybody at that time. And uh, I said, well, I'd be glad to baptize you. Make the preparations, and uh, we'll make plans. So only was fitting, he found me about 10 days ago, two weeks ago, and I was trying to call a turkey one night to uh, hunt the next morning. He found me over across the field there, and uh, he said, how about the 23rd of May? And I said, I'll be there. If uh, that works for you, it works for me. And uh, so he told me, we went out to lunch and I said, well, tell me about your salvation experience since I wasn't able to be a part of it. And he said that he was here one night for Team Kids that we used to have on Wednesday nights. And uh, after Team Kids that night, he was going back home with his mom and he began to tell her about uh, what had been talked about and the, really the reason why he got saved was because of that night. Uh, the Holy Spirit got a hold to him and he made a decision of faith there with his mom working him through it to uh, accept Christ into his heart. And so he comes this morning as a candidate for baptism and uh, in obedience and the following of Christ's example and command. And so he'll be entering into the membership of Buffalo Tabernacle and we're just so glad to, and honored to be a part of his decision of faith. And so, Tyler, have you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. Well, based upon your public profession of faith, turn face this way. Face this way. Based upon your public profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of the death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection, to walk in the nearness of life. Y'all give our brother a hand. Proud of you, man. Uh, as he goes and gets ready, we're going to stand and sing Amazing Grace. And uh, if you want to get ready, then we'll present you with your Bible. Let's stand. I'll lead you in the first verse, and then uh, I'll exit on the, on the last verse. And Tammy, if you'll lead them through that. But uh, let's sing together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved.
I don't know how all them country music artists do it when they change wardrobe. But it is my honor this morning to uh, present this Bible to Tyler based upon his public profession of faith and uh, for welcoming him into the church family as a whole, uh, Christ Church. And so we're so proud of you, Tyler. Congratulations. Y'all give him a hand. As y'all know, this is a remarkable young man. He graduated from Virginia Tech last Sunday, and uh, so he wasn't able to be here last Sunday. He graduated from Virginia Tech, uh, what's the degree? Wildlife and Forestry. Wildlife and Forestry degree, and got baptized today, starts work tomorrow in his uh, career. Uh, based out of Farmville, Quail, forever. And uh, we're just so proud of him, proud of his family that have raised him up. His mom and dad, his uh, grandma, and I know Grandpa's proud of it, and uh, great grandma and great grandpa. Such a blessing to have your family a part of us. But I want to have a word of prayer over him as he enters into uh, the real world tomorrow and uh, also entering into this next step of faith. Let's pray together as a church. Stand, if you would. Heavenly Father, we lift up Tyler to you at this time. Lord, it is an honor to be a part of his uh, obedience unto you today. In following Christ's perfect example in the baptism, Lord, we thank you for leading him to this point. And Father, from this day forward, we pray that you go with my brother. Lord, that you will lead and guide and direct him through these scriptures, that he will study and dedicate himself to understanding. Father God, we pray that you will lead him through every path of life. Keep him on the straight and narrow as he provides an example to both of his brothers, to the rest of his family and friends, and Lord, his co-workers. Father, we pray your blessings upon his career that he's now entering into uh, just tomorrow. And Lord, we pray that he be an example of Christ to those that he comes in contact with, that he will be able to lead someone else to Christ. And Lord, as a church, may we disciple him, teach him the ways of Scripture, and help him mature in his faith and persevere in growing closer to you. It's this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Y'all welcome our new brother.